where we continue tonight with this subject, Satanic Activity Today. You will remember that we've already looked at two areas of operation in the first two weeks, and last week we began to look in the third and biggest area of all, that of demon influence. That is something which affects every person on the planet, including us. The influence of demonic spirits who are abroad in the world today. I would remind you that we are not to become obsessed with that subject, as though we, we find demons around every corner, and every time we sneeze it's attributable to some evil or alien power. Of course not. But on the other hand, we need to understand that the whole of our society today is really largely controlled by demonic influences. The whole cosmos, the whole world order, the whole structure of society. Last week we looked at the influence of the devil upon world governments, in education, in entertainment, and in the area of music. And we began to see last week how in that last area, the area of music, Satan has perhaps got his biggest foothold into the churches. And it's through that kind of operation that so much that is other than of Christ has come into the churches by way of wrong teaching as well as wrong practice. We began to look at that last week. Now I'm going to take up from there and I'm just going to deal with one area tonight. So we certainly have at least another week on this subject of demon influence. Tonight, as God helps me, I intend to show the influence of the devil in worship and religion. Particularly, of course, in the Christian church. It is a very big subject, but I will try and deal with it as briefly as I can bringing what is necessary for us to know. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the Church of Jesus Christ, which your beloved Son, our Saviour, purchased with us. And we realise, Father, that because this was at your heart, and indeed, as the Word says, even before this world was formed, you had in your heart to do what you are actually doing in these days, calling out a people for yourself. And the Lord Jesus is called that lamb that was slain since the foundation of the world. We realise that the old serpent, the devil, is against that, is against the church. We realise it, Lord, as we look through world history and through the history of the church, how the church has, as the hymn writer says, has been by schisms, rent asunder by heresies distressed. We realise, Lord, that some of the persecution, much of it, that has taken place over the centuries, with millions of our brothers and sisters being martyred, the instigators and perpetrators of those violent acts were surely motivated by de demonic influences. And yet here we are, Father, as a testimony to the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ has triumphed and will one day openly display that triumph to the whole universe. We therefore pray, Lord, that as we share this subject tonight, you'll give us help and guidance and protection and all that we need. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. On one occasion, when I was preaching the word of God, someone in the congregation not present in this congregation, claim to have seen on either side of the preacher angelic spirits. Now I have no way whatever of knowing whether that was so or not, but I can tell you I'm absolutely sure that they are present whether or not they're seen. I believe in this meeting place tonight that the angels of God are present. I really do believe that with all my heart. And not only that, I believe it's eminently possible that there are demonic spirits present in this meeting too. 
That is one of the great facts of spiritual life. We will begin our look at this subject in the prophet Zechariah and the third chapter. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. Now, those who were in on the missionary training school at the end of last month, you will recall that we saw that wherever that expression, the angel of the Lord, definite article, the angel of the Lord occurs in the Old Testament, it is always speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. So the one that Joshua the high priest stood before was none other than our Saviour. He showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. If you were to read on, and we won't read on because it's not in my subject tonight, if you were to read on in those verses, you'll find that I can identify very, very, very well indeed with all that follows. For you find that the, the man of God uh, is clothed with filthy garments. And uh, so there's the accuser alongside you, so you can understand that. Oh, old Pat Curry being a preacher, you should see him, <laughs> you see. Old Joshua being a preacher, being a priest of God. Yes, that's right, we're all in that situation together. In ourselves there's nothing righteous. And you'll find that then you, the filthy garments are taken away and the Lord clothes with a change of raiment. That's wonderful. That's true for all of us tonight, because we know that we're all priests unto God, aren't we, as Christians? We've got nothing to boast in, of in ourselves at all. I, I really, you know, it's one of the most uh, unattractive things in a Christian, and probably the worst thing about it is that the one who's doing it doesn't know they are, when they have a sort of holier-than-thou attitude. Now it's possible I've got that, because I wouldn't know I had if I got it, would I? You understand? Everybody else would know it, but we don't. There's no way that we can really boast in ourselves at all. We're not to think of ourselves more highly than we are. What we can do, we can just give testimony to the grace of God in having clothed us and having given us some ministry to perform. And thank God tonight, when I stand here, I am clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. But you see the picture I'm trying to paint here. That real ministry is resisted by the devil. Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. So in that act of ministry, there is a battle going on around the minister that he may be as unaware of, and probably almost certainly is unaware of. Among Satan's many titles, there is that one accuser that I've just mentioned, and I suppose of all the activities of the devil, that is the one that we are most likely to succumb to. Either we listen to him whispering in our ear all about our own unworthiness, and so we sit around wringing our hands and saying, oh, wretched man that I am, or wretched woman that I am, for that matter. And we can become debilitated in our Christian ministry. We may sit around waiting for some bolt of light from heaven to make everything all right for us. We'll, we'll speak about some special work of the Holy Spirit, which we, uh, which we must certainly have, maybe, before we can get up and begin to serve the Lord. And we can listen and listen and listen to the old devil rattling the bones in our cupboard, the bones of our past failures. And, you know, that is something we need to resist. We are under the blood of Jesus. But also, of course, we give place to the devil when we allow other Christians to accuse yet other Christians to us. They're doing the devil's work too. Uh, Paul speaks about that, he calls it backbiting. Going behind people's backs and talking about them in a wrong way. Now sometimes it's necessary to, to talk about another brother or sister. It's necessary sometimes. But we always need to ask the question, is it true? And if it's true, is it necessary? Is it kind? And if it's not kind, we then have to say, is it necessary? We need to ask those three questions before we dare to take the name of another brother or sister on our lips and speak about them in a bad way, because it's not right. We're doing the devil's work, aren't we? But the other word, and this is right at the very heart of what I'm going to say tonight, I'm going to really speak about this one thing, more or less this one thing. One of the names that the Lord, the Lord Jesus gave to the devil was the word liar. 
Now, if you just turn to John 8, 44, John 8, 44, the Lord says this to those Pharisees to whom he was ministering. Let's bring it right up to date. The Lord Jesus is speaking these words to fundamentalist evangelical Christians. For well, that's who the Pharisees were as far as the Jewish religion was concerned. They were the fundamentalists. They were the ones who believed what God had said. And this is what he said to them. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. I have a very strong feeling that when we get to glory, by the grace of God, we're in for a bit of a shock as to who is going to be there and who isn't. We can follow the cold letter of the scriptures be absolutely right in all our doctrine and yet have another spirit in us you know don't you the place I give to correct teaching and correct doctrine it is a vital matter but on the other hand it's not enough to have your doctrine right we really need to have had a definite work of the Holy Spirit of God in our lives the Bible calls it new birth Absolutely right. Absolutely essential. Well, these to whom these Jesus was speaking, of course, were those who knew the Scriptures and uh, tried to follow the Scriptures, but they did that in letter and not in spirit because their father, says Jesus, your father is the devil. The fatherhood of God is a myth, actually. Not all human beings have God as their father in the sense that they've been created, of course, but not in the sense of being spiritual sons and daughters. These Pharisees had as their father, not Almighty God, but the devil. And Satan is called here a liar, and it's coupled, you know, with the word murderer in the same verse. He was a murderer from the beginning. That's putting us right back to the origins of the human race. We go right back to the Garden of Eden. And that's exactly what we're going to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And uh, he is a liar and the father of it. Never ever tell a lie. Because every time you do that, you are spawning something which the devil is at the back of. There's no such thing as a white lie. Sometimes we cannot give the truth in one sense, we cannot spill the beans, in which case we stay quiet. We do not tell a lie. We stay silent in that matter. I can think of cases where it would be right to stay silent than to answer a question. That's another story. Well, we're going to go back to Genesis. We're going to go back to Genesis chapter 3. And uh, you may like to keep this passage open, although it's very easy to turn back to, isn't it? as we go elsewhere in the Word of God. But Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, let's look at this lie of Satan. In fact, there's more than one in this passage. Genesis chapter 3, uh, I'll come back to the original lie in a moment, but verse 4, here is the lie, ye shall not surely die. You can do this particular thing, and you won't die. That was a lie, and as a result of that lie, humanity has had its cemeteries filled ever since. So he is a murderer because Satan, by his lie, has been responsible for the deaths of millions and millions and millions of human beings on this planet. Romans 5 verse 12 will uh, just give us the correct theology behind this. As by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. 
And the reason all have sinned is because we have a fallen nature that we are born with. I believe in original sin. I believe in a sinful nature that I didn't develop. I had it when I was born. And as a result of that, I was a sinner by, by nature, a sinner by choice, and a sinner by practice. And that's the same for every last one of us. And Satan is responsible for filling our graveyards by the lie that he gave in the Garden of Eden. So befuddled are men's minds today that we do not even see a lie. A very interesting verse in Isaiah chapter 44 that I came across as I was preparing this ministry tonight. Isaiah 44 and the 20th verse, speaking about those who make idols and so on. He feedeth on ashes, a deceived heart hath turned him aside, that he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? He's not even aware when there's a lie right there in his hand. He's got an idol, you see, and he's worshipping it. And it's a lie, really, but he can't even see it's a lie, even though it's as close as that to him. Indeed, man has made a deliberate exchange with truth. A couple of scriptures, one of which I'm going to come back to later on. Romans 1.25, speaking about those who change the truth of God into a lie. A deliberate exchange. They change the truth of God into a lie. And over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 10 and 11. This is by way of introduction, and uh, we'll be in the meat of it in a moment. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. You say, God's doing that. I'll wait a moment. Read back in the previous verse. Because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be, be saved. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. The choice, first of all, was with them. They chose not to embrace the truth. A couple of places in Revelation which show you the seriousness of following this original sin. Revelation 21, 27, There shall no wise enter into, into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie. But they which are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and in the next chapter, chapter 22, and verse 15. For outside, without, are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Think of that. The kind of company that liars are placed amongst in the scriptures. Dogs, that refers to homosexuals, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters. And whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. There are no liars in heaven. Except, of course, repentant ones who've seen it for the sin that it is. My mother used to say, when I you know, mothers say all sorts of things, and I can remember some of the things my mother said when I was a boy. She said, I'd rather have a thief than a liar to deal with. So I can lock my purse up but I can't lock my reputation up. A thief, more easy to deal with than a liar. Well, we can return back to Genesis chapter 3, and I'm going to read these verses in a moment. Genesis chapter 3, for I believe that what we have here is a continuing question that has been asked down the centuries. Verse 1 of Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. 
And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. I intend to show towards the end what actually happened. What it was that they actually did in the garden. What it meant to know good and evil. For I will tell you that Adam and Eve knew the difference between good and evil before they took the fruit. Oh yes. Otherwise, they would not have known that it was wrong to eat it. God had given them the choice. To obey or not to obey. They knew the difference between good and evil. So we'll have to see what that really means, that verse. You see, being made in the image of God means that we're capable of making moral choices. And Adam and Eve were capable of making moral choices. Of course they were. They were capable of that before they fell. They were made in the image of God. So we'll have a look at that in a moment, an apparent paradox. But uh, I want to look at this question that I believe has run like a thread through history. Yea, hath God said. Yea, hath God said. Or yea, hath God said. However you want to say it. There is a kind of sarcasm behind it. A kind of disbelief behind that question. And in one sense, it's at the root of all the assaults that have ever been made on the church, either from outside or from inside. If you say your Christ is alive, let him deliver you out of this one then, huh? as our Christian brothers and sisters were put to the sword, and worse, during the time of the Roman persecution. I'll tell you, my dear brothers and sisters, that that is a question that uh, those who are the enemies of the cross have been asking throughout the history of the church. And it's also, of course, come from inside the church. Where those who deny the miracles, those who deny the need for blood sacrifice, the gospel of gore, they have the audacity and blasphemy to say. Attacks from inside. Hath God said? We don't believe. The Bible is the word of God, they say. You're saying that God has said it. We don't believe that. We will, uh, we will uh, look at it. We will criticise it. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll sort of tear it to pieces. We'll show that it's not of divine origin. They're the kinds of attacks that have run in the history of the church. So far as worship is concerned, and that's the subject in hand tonight, there are three lying promises given by Satan in the verses we've just read. And I want to examine those with you. Three lying promises. is the thing to make a promise, isn't it? That's one thing. But... Not to fulfil the promise is another, but for the promise to actually be a lie, that's something even worse than that. If I promise a child something, I will always try to keep my promise to the child. In fact, if I promise anybody anything, I'll try to. But particularly with a child, I will try to keep my promise. Now, it may be that I can't keep my promise because circumstances I'm unaware of uh, overtake me. But if I was to make a promise that was a real lie, see... Knowing even at the end of that that the result of them acting on the promise would bring them pain, that's something which is completely heinous. Now look at this area. The first promise that Satan gives is of unconditional eternal life. In Genesis 3, 4, Ye shall not surely die. There is a promise, it's a lie. God had already stated that eternal life was dependent upon obedience. Chapter 2, verse 11. Sorry, verse 16. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So living, um, that is, without ever dying, eternal life was dependent at that time upon obedience. But Satan is saying, not so, you're not going to die even if you do eat the fruit. Unconditional eternal life. Of course, subsequent to the fall, eternal life is dependent upon an atoning sacrifice. 
and uh, of our response to that atoning sacrifice by another, even the Lord Jesus Christ. Just think for a moment of how this lie has come into the worship and religion of the world. I'll just touch on one or two areas. How about Buddhism? Where you have this promise of reincarnation, maybe as some other creature, uh, with the hope that you're going to rise gradually up the scale of life until you attain to perfection, eternal life, unconditional. Hinduism, which again believes in reincarnation. The Sikh religion, which is a, a spin-off from Hinduism, also believing in reincarnation. What about after-death experiences that we read about? People say, I had this experience and I died and uh, my heart stopped beating and, uh, you know, while I was in this state of death, in quotes, I saw this uh, tunnel and I was pulled through this tunnel and there was a big light at the end of it and uh, I saw all my loved ones and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, it was a place of happiness and all that kind of thing and then I was pulled back. You know the kind of story. Those after-death experiences are all part of the devil's lie. That eternal life is unconditional. It's very interesting that uh, sometimes folks that have had that have had no form of religion whatever. Afterwards they say, I now believe in life beyond the grave. They don't become Christians through that kind of experience. We become Christians through faith. What actually happens here, you see, is that the fear of death is removed. The fear of death, the fear of dying, the fear of, of, a, of a judgment to come is removed totally by these kinds of lying experiences that I believe the old devil is so e eager to give to people. Spiritism, exactly the same kind of thing. Where folk go to their seances and uh, some supposed relative, some relative uh, who's died, maybe a son, a daughter, a mother, father, grandfather, uncle, aunt, whoever it happens to be, has died and, uh, uh, and a spirit voice coming through the medium uh, claims to be the voice of the departed person. Of course, those who are there believe life beyond the grave, life eternal. It's all true, there is life beyond the grave, they say. They've got to get saved to get life beyond the grave. It's for everybody, you see. This is the kind of thought that comes through, through the spiritist seance. Uh, I did once find myself by accident, I may have shared it with some of you, I did by one, on one occasion find myself by accident in a spiritist meeting. It turned out to be a spiritist meeting. I didn't know it was a spiritist meeting before I went to it in the very early days of my Christian life. Well, I was younger. I don't know how many years I'd been a Christian. Probably about, I suppose, maybe about ten years by that time I'd been a Christian. And I found myself by chance in a meeting that um, was a spiritist meeting. You say, how could you possibly have done that? By chance? Well, I did do it by chance, and uh, I don't think I'll take time to tell you how it happened. But there I was, I'd gone to a meeting, midweek meeting, I'd been on holiday with my wife and the family that we had at that time. I'd been with my wife, we, were, we went to visit my mother-in-law for a brief holiday. And I thought I'd go to a midweek service. And I made a mistake by going to a church called the Church of the Holy Spirit. I thought it would be interesting to find out what these Pentecostals get up to in Ramsgate. You see, it's called the Church of the Holy Spirit. And I, I am telling you how I got in the meeting, aren't I? I think I'd better. And uh, I, went, I arrived at this place at the appointed hour and there didn't seem to be anything happening. And uh, I walked up down, I thought, strange. And I knocked on the door and the door opened a, a fraction and I was literally pulled inside the door with shut and locked behind me. And I found that there was about two dozen people or so inside that meeting. And I sat down, and the, there was a, a woman who was at the front who was walking up and down. And um, actually I've since found it was connected to this demonic place down the Lytham Road. Oh yes, we've got one down there. So-called World Healing Crusade. Spiritist place, that's what it is. And... Uh, However, she fastened her eyes upon me. I suppose it was about, you know, I was outside for maybe five, ten minutes. I walked around the block, I suppose. The meeting had been going for about a quarter of an hour by this time. She fastened her eyes on me. 
And she said, you know someone called Fred who's just passed over. Now, as a matter of fact, I did. That's the intriguing thing. I did know a man called Fred, a Christian man who sang in the same gospel choir as I did, who had recently died. I immediately rose to my feet. I didn't acknowledge whether or not she was right. And I said, words to this effect, I said, whether or not I know someone called Fred is, by the way, I be I've not come in order to disrupt it. I found myself in this meeting by accident, I said. But I believe that what you're doing is contrary to the teachings of the Bible, and I claim the covering of the blood of Jesus over me and over this place. And I sat down. And you know, the meeting came to a conclusion about two or three minutes afterwards because she could not get any other so-called messages from anybody. I'm just mentioning it. You see, the fact is that people that believe that lie, and it is a lie, it's a damnable lie, people who believe it, they, they, they feel that, uh, you know, uh, all they've got to do is just uh, nothing, nothing, and that they'll have eternal life. Is a lie from Satan, of course. Uh, and then we come right into the Church of Jesus Christ, where there are those ministers, and I sat under the ministry of such a man for, for a short period of my Christian life, who believes that God is a, God is a God of love, and therefore uh, all men and women ultimately are going to be saved. That God is going, because he's a God of love, he's going to swing open the doors of heaven, and no one finally will be lost. That's a lie. It's the devil's lie. You shall not surely die. You see, universalism, which is the teaching that everybody ultimately is going to be saved, is a lie from hell. Unconditional eternal life was the first lie. The second lie that was given in these verses, you'll find in the fifth chapter. God know, the fifth verse. God know, doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods. You shall be as gods. You're going to become like God. You're going to have personal divinity. Of course, we were looking in Romans chapter 1 a little while ago, where we see the elevation of things that have been created to the same level as, or even put above, the one who created them. Worshipping the creature, worshipping the thing that's created, rather than the creator. Putting the created thing in the place of God. Of course, we might say that that is idolatry. Well, idolatry is one form of that. So is paying £10 million for a footballer, another form of that. So is dressing up like the Spice Girls, another form of that. That is idolatry too, of course it is. Of course it is. Idolatry. It's the way of the world. If you turn back to Isaiah, or forward to Isaiah, whichever, if you're in Romans, it's back, isn't it? If you're in Genesis, it's forward. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. You'll find, you see, that before even Adam sinned, we have a record of what Lucifer did, who, of course, became the devil and Satan. Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. I'm going to be like God. I'm going to be like him. I'm going to sit where he sits. I'm going to become divine. Well, you remember the Lord Jesus was tempted in Matthew 4 by Satan, who tried in, in the end when he took the kid gloves off, if I can put it that way, and exposed himself in all his naked evil. He said, having shown the Lord the, all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, all this I will give you if, if you'll fall down and worship me. You see, he wanted to be like God. You want to be the one to have the worship. It's not without accident that the first of the commandments is thou shalt have no other God beside me. You see, that's, uh, it appeals to us to be, like, to be like God. Let me just speak about the Mormons briefly. 
Uh, I'm not here to tear people down uh, or individuals down. It's not my purpose tonight to name names unless I have to. One or two names I may have to mention. But the Mormons. Just in case anybody is under the sad delusion that they are a Christian denomination. And I'll tell you, the Mormons try to, try, try to pose as a Christian denomination. They could try to do that. They call themselves the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, I've had contact with one or two Mormons, and they, they try to pass themselves off as being, uh, you know, an alternative denomination to Baptist or Methodist or Church of England or something else. They're not a Christian church at all. Their religion is quite incredible. Quite incredible. I'll say something more about that in a moment. But this is one of their main tenets. What man is, God was. And what God is, man may become. Do you hear that? What man is, God was. They say that God was Adam. Incredible, isn't it? And what God is, man may become. We can become gods too, they say. We can become gods. We'll become divine. We can have spiritual children. It's a lie. It's not original. It's a lie from Satan. It's one of those lies that we read about here in Genesis. The third lie, and perhaps we'll take more time with this because it's very important to us in our church and in our sort of particular area of activity. The third lie of Satan was that he would introduce them to secret knowledge. This is in Genesis 3, 5 and 6. Ye, your eyes shall be opened in the day that you eat thereof. Your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Introduction to secret knowledge. Now if you want the proper word for that, it's Gnosticism. G-N-O-T-I-S-C-S-M. Gnosticism is what it is. And I need to take you right back to the beginning of things in the book of Genesis where we have the religion founded by Nimrod way back in the book of Genesis. And that became known through the years as the Babylonian Mysteries. And the priests involved in those ancient rites and ceremonies, they had all kinds of mystical powers, or they claimed to have them. And uh, those of you who were here when I was preaching on the history of the Roman Catholic Church, when I traced the history of the Roman Catholic Church from the book of Genesis chapter 10, right the way through to our own day and on, you will know how the Babylonian mysteries ultimately found their way to Rome via Pergamos, and that Julius Caesar was the supreme pontiff, and the Caesars continued to hold that title until eventually it was taken over by the Bishop of Rome, Bishop Damasus. And uh, from that time on, the Bishop of Rome has been the Supreme Pontiff. Now the Roman Catholic Church is very good at telling lies. They don't want the right history. They don't like real history. They like their own kind of history. They'll tell you Peter was the first Pope. That's a lie. Nimrod was. All right. Yes, they were here long before we were. They were here before Christ was around on, on this earth. The Roman Church, under a different name, was here in the time of Nimrod and onwards. The priests in Old Testament times who were party to these Babylonian mysteries had power to hear confessions and give absolution. And, by the way, make the sign of the cross. That is a fact. The sign of the cross is not a Christian thing at all. It's a Babylonian thing. I can prove it. I don't need to prove it. You can prove it for yourself by going to any public library and looking it up. They had power to hear confession and give absolution. They also had the power to manufacture a god out of a wafer. How about that? It's a fact, not fiction. What tremendous power these ancient Old Testament, Babylonian Old Testament period, Babylonian priests had. It was something which 
only they had access to. This is uh, the kind of secret knowledge that Satan was promising to Adam and Eve. You're going to have this secret knowledge that only God has, but you're going, you're going to have it too. A special class of people with access to a secret kind of knowledge which they can then pass on to others who are in the know. Let's think about one or two examples of that in our own time. How about Joseph Smith? Having some wonderful plates, gold plates, with mysterious writing on, that only he was party to. And he puts on these special glasses, or he looks through these special crystals, whichever story you are told about it, and he's able to decipher these, and he dictates them from behind the screen to those on the other side. I mean, it's incredible anybody should believe such hogwash, but people do. People who don't want the truth, they'll go after the lie, you see. Well, God will give them over to it as well, let me say, if they don't love the truth. It's a form of Gnosticism. And that's perpetrated and carried on, uh, perpetuated rather, in the Mormon setup. For example, uh, I am married to my wife, as you all well know. If I was a Mormon, and I, was, uh, I went right into the thing, I could, if I wanted to, and my wife wanted to, we could have a marriage for eternity, completely in contradiction to what the scriptures have to say about it, by the way. We could have a marriage for eternity, which is not open to everybody, it's only to those little select group that are in the know. And then we could have spiritual children. Well, what, a, what a horror, my wife said. We've had eight children, we're going to have spiritual children throughout eternity. <laughs> but this is, this is the idea, you see. It's a secret kind of uh, little thing just for a group. Joseph Smith and the Mormons. Or Mary Baker Eddy and the Christian scientists. She suddenly gets some revelation that's only for her, and then she's able to pass it on. So-called Christian science, which is neither of those two things. And then Ellen White, as a Seventh-day Adventist, she has over 2,000 visions. Over 2,000 visions, she claims to have, giving a special revelation from God. Gnosticism. You shall have this kind of knowledge. You're going to have your eyes open, says the devil. And, uh, well, you could go right on, couldn't you? The gurus, who, the Maharishis, where you can go and learn from the Beatles, in their time went off and sat at the feet of one of these Maharishis to, uh, to hear the sort of wisdom that he could impart. And, uh, and, I, and I say this, and I'm, I don't wish to be offensive, but isn't the Pope of Rome in the same bracket when he sits upon the throne of St. Peter and speaks ex cathedra and has some fresh revelation of new teaching unknown to anybody else, you see? For example, that the Virgin Mary was bodily taken up into heaven without dying. He's given a special revelation. If that's not in the Bible, of course it's not. And that little bit of teaching has come about during your lifetime, my friend. During the lifetime of most of you sitting here, anyway. It's a form of Gnosticism. It's going right back to the lies of Satan. And you could go ad infinitum. You could go to the witch doctors, if you wish, in some of the more primitive parts of Africa where the witch doctors alone have access to the spirits, and they get the special word, and they've got these special powers that are not available to anybody else. Gnosticism. It's a, a form of uh, the lie that the, the devil gave to Adam and to Eve, or to Eve in the garden, and she certainly passed it on to, to her husband. Uh, I want to move on to another area, under this same general heading. The art of visualisation. Now that's come right into the church and you'd be surprised at some of the churches that have visualisation and inner healing in their services. Where past memories are dealt with and done away with and uh, present problems are dealt with and done away with as we visualise the Lord Jesus. As we visualise him. And uh, uh, he, we, we visualise him actually coming to us and, uh, and dealing with the problem itself. Uh, let me give you an example, an actual case. A woman who, I mean, I've had uh, one or two cases like this myself in my, in my years as a pastor, um, but here's a case. A woman who no longer loves her husband and really doesn't want him anywhere near her, and so what she is told to do is to visualise the Lord Jesus walking in through the door. You understand? When it's, uh, let's say, six o'clock at night and her husband's coming home from work, she is to visualise the Lord Jesus 
She's to practice this in the home before he arrives. And she's to, to actually see a picture of Jesus coming in and she's to practice this at home. This is what she's told to. Visualise the Lord Jesus walking through the door and you come to him with your arms outstretched and you embrace him and you tell Jesus how much you love him. See? And then when your husband comes home, instead of it being Jesus, now it's, uh, say, Bill or whatever his name happens to be. And you then go to Bill and say, oh, Bill, I love you. See? <laughs> it's incredible. Actually, I think, it's, I think it's horrible, to be honest with you. Horrible. Or the repeating of the name of Jesus, 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 as a kind of mantra. To, uh, uh, to, 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 to work up and generate emotions within, inside oneself. Let yourself go, these people are told. Feel his love. Feel the firmness of his body near yours. Oh yes! This is what they're told to do. Let him draw you to you. And they sit there and I'm sure they're well-meaning people. They're saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And they begin to come into an ecstasy. It's a form of idolatry, actually. Idolatry. The very people that practice that would probably almost have a fit if you told them it's the same as making a statue in the corner and bowing down to that and embracing the statue and kissing the statue. It's a form of idolatry. As is the word of faith or positive confession. It's all part of this Secret knowledge that we're told we can have. One eminent man says this. Claim the healing. Claim your prosperity. Claim all the blessings that are yours by right. I find that quite incredible. Or how about this, and I will tell you who said this. I'm quoting from a man called Yonggi Cho. Claim and speak the word of assurance, for your word actually goes out and creates. God spoke and the whole world came into being. Your word is the material which the Holy Spirit uses to create. So give the word. This is very important. Let me quote from a witch. Magic works on the principle that it is so because I say it so. Any different? I don't think so. I believe it comes from the same source. There was a man called Frederick Mesmer, who was born in Austria in the 1700s, and in 1772 he latched upon a new way of healing people. And in 1778 he caused a sensation by healing thousands of people of all kinds of illnesses. What he would actually do, he would come to people, he would put his hand over what he called their animal field, around their body like this. I've seen people doing this in Christian so-called churches. Running their hands around, not actually touching the body, but running it around the so-called field. Or touching them maybe with a, with a metal rod. And in his clinics, this is established, it is verified, it is, uh, you can actually go and test it and prove it for yourself, it's in writing. In his clinics, what happened would be people would fall on the floor and go into a trance. Some of them would begin to laugh hysterically and they couldn't stop. Some of them would make extraordinary noises. Some of them will get hiccups. And uh, I'm asked why I speak so strongly against things like that in the Christian church. I'll tell you why I'm against things like that in the Christian church. They come from the same source, the occult. Mesmer was an occultist. The word mesmerism, of course, comes from that. Hypnotism, mesmerism, it comes from the name of Frederick Mesmer. Sometimes he's known as Franz Mesmer. Same man. The, uh, this whole name it and claim it thing, by the way, was founded by a woman called Emma Curtis Hopkins. And uh, that was in the 1880s. She was a Christian scientist. It's not new either. What I'm trying to indicate to you tonight 
is that all this that I certainly know and believe is a cult in origin has found its way into the Christian church. And some of the famous names, the most famous names around today are involved up to their necks in it. I don't want to offend any here. Some of the names may be people that you respect and admire. It's not my purpose to tear any human being down merely to tell you that what they say is wrong. And I don't care who says it. It's still wrong. Word of faith, positive confession. You know, you feel ill, but you're not going to be ill. You say, I claim my healing, I claim prosperity, I claim a better job, and so on and so on. And Well, I, I think it's, uh, it's horrendous. People are believing the lie. Christianity, you see, no longer uses Bible doctrine as the measure of life and soundness, but rather excitement, experiences, and sensationalism. And the more sensational it is, the more the Holy Spirit is supposed to be working. The more exciting it is, it must be the Holy Spirit, mustn't it? I don't believe it necessarily has to be the Holy Spirit at all. I had a letter today from a person in another part of the country. It was written in a way I perhaps should have brought the letter and read a part of it to you. It was written to me and... She receives regular ministry from this church, like I said. And this lady has said that in her own area where she is, there is no Bible church she can go to. And a lot of what she is exposed to in her area is exactly what I'm talking about tonight. And she knows it's wrong. And she's enclosed the leaflet, she said, this is the latest thing. And she's enclosed a, a photocopied article out of a fairly well-known magazine. She said, this is, what are we to do with a thing like this? Well, I don't care how famous the name is, if they base what they have to say and what they believe on something other than the Bible, then there's something wrong with what they say and believe. And that'd be the same for me, would it not? Galatians 5.9, I don't want to unnecessarily delay you tonight, I want you to hear what I've had to say and take it on board. Because these things are going to become, you know, the PDC, these things, they run from one thing to another. The one thing is this, then it's something else, and then it's something else, then it's something else. This is what Galatians 5.9 says. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I believe that the yeast has been inserted into the Christian church. And the whole church in this nation is rapidly becoming rotten. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. We have to stand against that kind of thing. There are some things that will never happen in this church for as long as I'm the pastor here. That's a fact. It will never happen in this church if I'm the pastor here. For a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And if folk want the excitement, they want to roll on the floor, you go somewhere else, as I go somewhere else, it's as simple as that. How do we judge a live church today? We count the numbers sitting on the seats. It can be an indication, not necessarily, but it can be an indication that God is blessing. It can be an indication of something else. How are we to judge a live church? I'm nearly through. Just a couple of scriptures from Revelation. It isn't easy, you know, to, to be different. It isn't easy to take a stand. I don't find it easy to take a stand. Not really. It's a hard, hard thing to take a stand, really. When you, it means that you have fellowship with very few other ministers, actually. Very few. There are some. Praise God, you can. But comparatively few. Seems to me the church has gone mad. It would do some of us good to read some of the letters that come through my letterbox from Christians in other parts of the country who do not know which way to turn. And there are hundreds of Christians in Blackpool who are swimming around, got no church, going from one place to another, or going nowhere. And in a way you can understand it. They're getting this kind of teaching there, that kind of teaching there, and it's not based on the Bible, it's all based on experience. 
And the man up front is the man with, a, with all the knowledge and he's got access to something you haven't got and you better get like him or else you're not going to get the blessings in, in your Christian life. Listen, friend, we're all believers in Christ, all priests unto God. We've got the same access to the same scriptures. I've got no special knowledge or revelation from God that you haven't got either. I've got a different ministry from you, that's all. And it's my part of my function to bring things out from the word of God and to warn as well as to exhort and to build up God's people. But I, I'm not a, uh, someone who's got secret powers. Of course not. Revelation 3. Unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard. And hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not work to watch, I shall come on thee as a thief. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. We could name some of the churches. We say, oh, wow, the Holy Spirit's moving there. Let's go over to the church over at Toronto and see what's happening over there. In the airport church. Let's go down to that church. Let's go to Sunderland. Let's go here. Let's go there. And I believe God's word would be the same. You've got a name that you live, but you're dead. Ah, then you find the other side of the coin. Revelation 2, verse 8. Unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. I, have, I know thy, the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. You may be tried. You shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He doesn't say, oh, just speak the word positive healing. I'm going to be, I'm going to be rich in money. Look, these people are poor. <laughs> the Lord didn't say to them, oh, just believe. You've got all the riches. You just have to say, I want a thousand uh, dollars. I want a thousand pounds, whatever, and you'll get it. I want a bigger house. I, I... The Lord says here, trouble, poverty. You're going to go to prison. You're going to suffer. But you're rich. What a difference. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. This church has not one word of blame from the Saviour. Not one word of blame. It's all praise. It's all encouragement. It's all exhortation. What about us? I don't think we've got anything to fear. We're on the victory side and it makes no difference how many others are going different ways. We're on the victory side. And so long as we base what we believe upon the word of God and not upon what a man says he's had in a vision. I'm, I'm appalled. I'm appalled at the way the whole church will go quiet if someone has a, a vision. They hardly want the word of God preached at all. Can't stand that. That's appalling. It's appalling. We must base what we believe on the word of God. Yes, we've got to, of course we've got to experience the real power of the Holy Spirit as well. But the Holy Spirit has inspired the word of God and we're on the victory, so I've got nothing to fear. We're to stand fast and, uh, and endure even unto the end. And the Lord says, be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. Demonic influence in the house of God. We have been warned. Let's bow from where to prayer.